Uh, welcome to Improving Fast Security. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask people to participate and uh, ask questions during the talk. So if you have a question, ask. I'll, I'll throw this, the mic over to you. So um, I grew up in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, my brother and I we ran a lot of LAN parties and video games. Um, and we'd run um, live CDs with everything pre-installed so we didn't have to uh, troubleshoot other people's computers. And uh, in high school, my other big uh, interest was hacking. My best friend and I did a lot of kind of script kitty stuff. Uh, it was a lot of fun, not too serious. Uh, and then uh, I became really interested in primatology and biology. So I kind of left computers for a while. Uh, I worked for the horticulture department. Uh, I'd catch tree frogs at 2 a.m. Uh, in swamps. Uh, I've raised hundreds of thousands of cockroaches. It's terrible. Uh, I then worked for the agronomy department where I, I uh, did a hazelnut breeding program. Uh, and that led to funding at, a, at the horticulture department at the University of Minnesota, uh, where we did metabolomics on plants. So we'd study how uh, the small chemicals of plants work. And um, in that department, I was able to do uh, uh, BOSS software. Um, they let me create a server uh, to run their lab. Um, and so uh, I was there for five years, and then a year and a half ago, I pivoted um, and uh, began working for Canonical's Ubuntu security team. Uh, and I really don't like talking about myself, uh, but I wanted to show that anyone who's passionate can make a big difference in security. Uh, and this talk is for anyone working in FOSS. There's best practices you can use to um, to work through vulnerabilities and to communicate. So uh, common weakness uh, evaluation, or CWE, um, is a way to classify different vulnerabilities. There's many families uh, of vulnerabilities, and CWEs organize that. Um, CWEs are defined uh, by the MITRE Corporation. Uh, they have a website with a lot of different types. Um, if you're working with vulnerabilities, it's useful to determine the CWE you're working with. Uh, this will give you insight on what the vulnerability is doing, and it lets you communicate with others about the CW or about the vulnerability quickly. Common Vulnerability Scoring System, or CVSS, is pretty controversial. It's um, how the severity of a CVE is determined. Um, they're not perfect, uh, but they're the industry standard. They're useful. Um, so in this case. Um, up on the left, we see attack vector is adjacent. This means that the vulnerability is not remotely exploitable over the internet, but it's adjacently exploitable. So over wireless or Bluetooth, someone could attack someone. And in this case, uh, availability is uh, marked as high. That means that the affected vulnerable component can be denied service. So uh, com common vulnerability enumeration, or as it's almost always called CVE, uh, is a communication tool. Um, they are the common name for vulnerabilities. Um, when you use CVE IDs, um, you can describe it uh, between organizations. So the upstream will, uh, will speak about the CVE in their blog posts, and then downstream organizations like Ubuntu will also use that CVE to track the issue uh, and report on it. So let's take a look at how CVEs can be used uh, to communicate vulnerability. Uh, say we have an upstream software project like SQLite. Uh, downstream of SQLite are projects like Node SQLite 3, and downstream of Node SQLite 3 uh, is NPM, which distributes the package uh, SQLite 3. Uh, if there's a vulnerability in SQLite, uh, they will notify Node SQLite 3 so they can patch it. And then uh, NPM has NPM audit, and you can a user can run NPM audit to know if they are affected. So it's a whole kind of communication chain based on the CVE ID. So CVEs contain a lot of metadata. Um, if there's a vulnerability in your uh, software, it's best if you, the upstream, help write this metadata. Uh, I'm only going to highlight a few parts of CV information. Uh, the most important part is the CVE description. This is where most people learn about a CVE for the first time, and this should be very clear. Uh, there's four main components for this description you should always have. Um, an explanation of the attack um, using the vulnerability, uh, the impact of the vulnerability, uh, what software is affected, and anything else that's pertinent to like the attack vector 
uh, other vulnerability. Uh, severity, as we mentioned, it's a it characterizes the the uh, impact of their vulnerability, and then uh, references are part of the CVE ID, uh, and um, they're helpful to like look through bug reports or uh, notices from upstream or third parties. And um, it's not required, but an accurate CWE ID is really helpful. So um, the CVE program is sponsored by the U.S. federal government and the MITRE Corporation. Uh, they are the ones who manage CVE IDs. Um, and if you look at this graph, there's a few spikes in it. Uh, initially, uh, in the early years, only the CVE board members could assign CVEs, so they'd actually meet at a round table or something like that. And for every CVE request, they would decide if they're going to uh, assign it or not. And then in 2005, MITRE began assigning CVEs. And in 2017, they opened up to other external organizations like Canonical to be CVE numbering authorities or CNAs um, who are trusted to assign uh, CVEs directly. Um, so today, there are many CNAs ran by distros, programming languages, software vendors, uh, and others. So recently, there was a really popular blog post uh, by Daniel Steinberg of Curl about uh, CVE misuse. Um, uh, especially when it comes to uh, severity metrics. So um, I have a few examples of bogus CVEs just so people get a sense of they aren't infallible. So um, a CVE, this is an example of a CVE that is not considered a, a vulnerability by upstream. So in this case, uh, researchers thought they found an issue in Git. Uh, they went out to the Git mailing list. They described it. Uh, the Git maintainer said, this isn't a vulnerability. This works exactly as we document it. Um, but the reporter asked for a CVE and wrote a cheeky blog about it anyways. Uh, and this caused a lot of uh, frustration for uh, downstream maintainers, the upstream, and also users. Um, this is an example of a CVE that's probably not maliciously assigned, but um, it's, it's a bug. It's not a, a security threat but it was originally assigned to CVE, and then later the CNA uh, rejected the CVE. Uh, this is a CVE that is outside the upstream security scope. So this is for InfluxDB. InfluxDB documents that uh, the user needs to add a security layer to protect InfluxDB. If you just put InfluxDB on the internet, attackers can just access the database and dump it, and it's not their fault if an administrator doesn't do that. So, as a developer, you should always document what you consider uh, a CVE, what's your security scope, uh, usually in like security policy or the readme. And this is a downstream CVE that was assigned to upstream. So uh, this is an issue in Node SQLite 3 that was, act, or that was assigned to SQLite. And uh, there's kind of a recent phenomenon of possibly bogus uh, CNAs. Uh, so in this example, um, it appears that uh, the CNA VolDB uh, scrapes GitHub commit messages for words like SQL injection, and then they have like a form letter where they just automatically assign a CVE. Uh, and if they had translated the Portuguese, uh, they'd realize that this is actually a homework assignment. <laughs> Most CVEs are not bogus. Um, they're the primary way that the Ubuntu security team tracks vulnerabilities um, are there any questions? So um, please raise your hand if you work on a FOSS project. All right, and now uh, please raise your hand if you have written a security policy. <laughs> that That's better than most. So, um, Security policies are extremely important. Their primary purpose is to explain how a reporter can contact you. Uh, this is uh, LXD's security policy. They have a model example of how to write a policy. Um, they state how to contact the project, they describe their threat model, and they link to uh, other security documentation. So if you take one thing away from this talk, please go home, write a security policy if your project doesn't already have one. Uh, the OpenSSF has guides. Uh, and they're, they're great.
Uh, and at the end of this, uh, if you download these slides, there's a bunch of resources at the end, so you can click these links. Uh, GitHub uh, recently added a private vulnerability reporting feature. So up in the right, it says report a vulnerability. Uh, if you click that button, the reporter has a special uh, form. Uh, you can't define it as uh, the project, but GitHub maintains this form. Um, and uh, so the, the reporter can describe the vulnerability and then uh, it creates a private issue that only you, the reporter, in GitHub can see. And then GitHub's security team will help um, uh, coordinate this vulnerability between you and the reporter. So if the reporter has an issue or if you have an issue with the reporter, they'll help mediate that. And GitHub is a CNA, so they can also assign a CVE to the issue if, if you agree to it as the, as the upstream and the reporter wants it. Uh, vulnerability discovery is a huge topic. Um, there are static analyzers, which can help identify parts of code that are likely vulnerable, and then you can assess later. Uh, you can uh, write fuzzers. This is an example of one of my colleagues who is using um, like free uh, GitHub CI actions to fuzz his projects. And uh, bug bounties are really well known. Uh, I don't recommend this until you've done the other steps of fuzzing and running analyzers on your code. Otherwise, you'll get a deluge of a lot of people making reports, especially for offering money. Um, so this is a really huge talk. Uh, Andre has a workshop tomorrow uh, that's an hour and a half long uh, going over stack analyzers and fuzzers. So it's hands-on. This is an example. Run the program, find the vulnerability. So if you're not involved with a specific project and you want to get involved in security, you still can. Uh, many projects aren't running static analyzers or fuzzers on their uh, their projects. Um, you can help triage security ports. Um, often the bug issue tracker will have security issues that are open for weeks or months. Um, and a lot of projects don't have a security policy, so you can suggest that. So uh, when hackers, security researchers, grad students, developers, or someone finds a vulnerability in your project, what can they do? They could keep the zero-day vulnerability a secret to themselves. They can file a public bug report. They might demand money. They might brag on a mailing list. Or they might privately report the vulnerability to your project. Whether you like it or not, the discoverer has the ability to publish vulnerability information however they want. There are many models for how to make private vulnerability or a zero-day public. Um, as a project, on one extreme is full disclosure. Uh, this means that the vulnerability immediately becomes public knowledge. Uh, this could happen by reporting the issue to a public bug tracker. On the other extreme is private disclosure, where the upstream project, uh, you, uh, receive a vulnerability report and either take no action or silently patch it. Uh, this uh, sweeps the problem under the rug and leaves uh, users vulnerable. Uh, the happy middle ground is coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Uh, in this case, um, uh, the zero day is worked on and uh, fixed, and then uh, affected uh, stakeholders are notified so that they can patch uh, the issue um, before it's publicly announced. So uh, communication is key. Um, always keep the line of communication with the reporter open and positive. Uh, often people will neglect uh, uh, replying to the reporter. Um, uh, if a reporter is coming to you, it means they want the issue fixed. Uh, and it is your chance to steer disclosure. So uh, be open and positive and uh, admit vulnerabilities, own them. Um, Vim is a great example of owning vulnerabilities. Uh, the late author of Vim, Brad Moulinaire, uh, began running a bug uh, bounty uh, in September 2021. In a one-year span, there is over 130 bugs reported, and at least half of them uh, were assigned CVEs. Uh, I originally made these slides uh, in November 2022 uh, for Ubicon Asia before Brom passed away, because Brom is an exemplary uh, maintainer for um, owning CVEs and um, how, how to patch CVEs. Uh, on the other extreme is private disclosure. Uh, if anyone's familiar with the Kitty text uh, terminal, um, in their security policy, they state that they treat security bugs as bugs. Uh, so if you look at their uh, change log, 
They'll make no mention of fixing security issues. Uh, and some of these issues are very serious, like remote code execution. And as a downstream maintainer, I can't patch that because I'm not notified about it. And if you're finding RCEs in your code often, there's probably some bigger issues also. So be like Rom, own your bugs, own your vulnerabilities, fix them and protect users. That doesn't mean that every bug report is credible. If a reporter immediately asks for money, that's a big red flag. But even if the reporter, if the report has no security uh, relevance, uh, stay positive and set clear expectations. Thank you should always be the first thing you tell the reporter. Your communication will impact future uh, interactions. Coordinated vulnerability disclosure is a very large topic. Uh, this is a highly idealized and still complicated example of CVD. Uh, initially, the researcher should reach out to the affected project uh, or vendor and agree to a response. Um, often they will choose a coordinated release date or CRD on when to announce the vulnerability, such as uh, after 90 days uh, from the initial report. Other parties may be involved to help uh, mediate and coordinate the response. Um, there are, if you uh, don't feel comfortable coordinate, coordinating it, there are third parties which will help you and the reporter coordinate it. Uh, the time uh, before the CRD is called the embargo period. So if you talk to downstream projects and stakeholders, no one is supposed to publicly discuss it during the embargo period. CVD gives upstream vendors the opportunity to investigate and prepare a patch and for upstream to coordinate their patches with the downstream projects. And using CVD as your vulnerability disclosure model protects users since multiple affected parties can release a patch on the same day. Uh, if you're interested in this, I really recommend a talk by the OpenSSF group uh, called Preparing uh, for Zero Day uh, from the 22 uh, Linux Security Summit in North America. So um, for coordinating with downstreams, if your project needs to perform coordinated vulnerability disclosure, you should uh, identify who are your trusted downstreams, people that you trust to not uh, leak the information early. Um, if you're not aware of who these downstreams are, or if uh, you believe that it affects most distributions, um, there's something called the distro mailing list, and it contacts the major distributions. Um, there's some more kind of general tips. Um, uh, be involved in the CVE process. Um, the CVE description is the first place most people uh, look when they learn about a vulnerability. And since you are the maintainer, you will understand the nature of the vulnerability better than others. So try to write the description if you can. Um, and then participate in bug reports. Uh, downstreams will use the bug reports and learn about the vulnerability through um, those reports, and they'll usually be tagged as a reference in the CVE metadata. Uh, depending on the severity of the vulnerability, you might want to do uh, CVD or make a public announcement on your website, but it kind of depends on, on what your metric for that vulnerability is. Uh, and then change logs and release notes should always mention vulnerability fixes uh, before uh, between versions and always include the CVE ID. So, uh, so backporting is porting a patch from a newer version uh, of software to an older version of software. And backports have a special significance to security maintenance as downstream uh, projects often cherry pick uh, parts of a security patch uh, to apply. For example, Ubuntu and other distros backport security uh, patches to protect older releases uh, like Focal's kernel. Sometimes backports are simple and others uh, bring breaking changes with them. A regression is a bug uh, that when you fix it, you introduce new bugs. Uh, a regression could happen to an upstream uh, when they apply the fix, or it could be uh, or the downstream could introduce the regression when they're applying a backport. Uh, as an upstream, uh, there are best practices you can follow to help uh, uh, downstream security maintainers. Uh, and so these are more examples from, from Brahm. Um, and he does three things that I think are, are critical. So uh, in the patch commit, he, deal, he clearly describes the problem and the solution. Um, and Brahm also uh, nicely formats um, uh, the patch, and that's consistent 
uh, between uh, his fixes. And uh, one thing that would make this a little bit more clear is if he added a CVE ID to the commit message. Uh, security patches, patches that should be specific. Uh, you shouldn't be refactoring parts of your code style or introducing new features or fixing multiple bugs at once. Uh, have a, a clear, concise uh, um, uh, fix for a single vulnerability. Uh, and it's not necessary, but it's really nice to uh, add a, a test so that when um, someone patches the vulnerability, they can make sure that the vulnerability is actually fixed. Um, so um, that's the end of my talk, but I want to thank the Ubuntu security team, especially my uh, mentors, Seth Arnold and uh, Jay Vosberg at Canonical. And a uh, big thanks to OpenSF First and MITRE. They have a lot of resources and they'll take your questions. And uh, I also want to thank my brother. This is our, um, our live CD that we used to run at LAN parties. Uh, are there any questions? If I, if I find the vulnerability, then I make a patch and then send the patch to all the affected downstreams without pushing it to my GitHub for 19 days. So I leave the vulnerability unfixed on my public GitHub for 90 days, right? Uh, no, the, the 90 days um, is... So um, usually the, the project can uh, announce earlier than the 90 days. So if you have a, a patch after two weeks, you'll tell the reporter. And uh, sometimes the reporter wants to write a blog about that. So they might say, like, could you wait just like another day so I can write my blog? Um, but the upstream project usually can release early if they have patches available. The 90... It, because I need to strike a balance between leaving it unfixed and public and also publishing the fix will show that there's the bug, right? Yes. Well, it, it can also depend. Like, if you're, if you're not concerned that you have a lot of downstreams that will be affected by it, you might not need to do uh, a long coordinated vulnerability disclosure. You might not need to talk to downstreams. But it, it depends. Okay. Thanks. Um, what, what is when you get a vulnerability report or some security issue was reported on your project and you you lack the resources or the the understanding whether it, maybe it's a very hard security problem and usually hmm. you you're not into security. Um, to whom could you reach out to get help to, to get fixed, mm -hmm. the, the problem fixed? Um, so you might want to reach out to OpenSSF and first. Um, but if, like, you know, if, since you're with Canonical, you could reach out to your security team. Um, um, you'd have to find someone in the know. Um, but usually there's people who are interested in security and want to protect users. Um, but if anyone has that issue, uh, contact Ubuntu Security and we'll help connect you. Um, sometimes we do get that question um, uh, through our email. Um, what uh, qualifies um, a CVE? Like, where is the thin line where you say this is a CVE that needs the appropriate procedures and all things, especially if uh, there's a vulnerability that uh, affects like an ecosystem and it's like a mix of different uh, bugs, I would say, mm -hmm. and that would have like to work together to to uh, to make a security vulnerability. Uh, what, what qualifies a CVE, basically? Yep. Um, so, well, uh, there's a differentiation between bugs and vulnerabilities. So, and, and that line is, does it impact security? Uh, and then if something requires a CVE or not is kind of subjective. Um, and uh, I've, I've spoken to people who, um, who run the CVE program and, and they kind of give the same response where it, it depends. Um, so uh, if you think it's going to have a high impact, it should have a CVE. Um, but if, you know, if it's like your homework, you probably don't need to sign a CVE to it. Uh, it it's, depends on context. Uh, CVE uh, 4.0 just got CVSS uh, 4.0 just got released. Do you think that uh, that will improve uh, the shoring system? Um, possibly. Um, so they have more temporal scores in there. Uh, and temporal scores are really useful to know how much of an impact a CVE actually has. 
But the issue is that the CNA has to keep on updating that CV entry to be relevant because um, so um, so CVSS uh, or uh, 3.1 has like additional options which aren't required where you can say like uh, does a POC exist? Does a patch exist? And that changes over time. So um, I'm a little reluctant to about those options because the CNA has to keep on updating it over time. It's a good thing, but you need better involvement from the CNAs. Uh, thank you for your talk. It's great. Uh, I sometimes package up other people's software, like, for example, in a snap. And if I run um, a security scanner uh, like Gripe, for example, against that folder full of stuff, it will often give me a list of CVEs or other stuff that affect components that I've bundled together. Mm -hmm. um, it feels super overwhelming for me to have to then go through all of those and figure out if they really are going to affect me. Is that just like tough shit? You should do that because you're distributing software or is it like, what else should I do? Um, well, I mean, it is tough. Um, but, um, uh, scanners can be a little flaky. They like, uh, like they'll, 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 they'll pin it to a specific version and then the back ports won't be tracked by the scanners. Um, but you know, you've written about like the staff ecosystem and security and there's like definitely things that can be approved from like an architectural standpoint to secure snaps better and that could apply to kind of any other project right so uh, building up on top of the last question so a lot of these scanners they might show like a list of vulnerabilities where they have like uh like cve ids however some like some vulnerabilities on the list will not have CVE IDs, but would rather mm -hmm. have somewhat called Brisma IDs. Mm. So I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard of, of, of that term before, Brisma. Mm -hmm. and, and it feels like these kind of vulnerabilities are somehow neglected compared to the CVE. So I'm just wondering what exactly are Brismas and, and how do they compare to normal like CVEs? Uh, I'm not familiar with that term, but like uh, like GitHub security, um, like they have GHSAs right. uh, and like Rust has their own uh, CVE like numbering system um and, and I, I imagine more vendors are going to have their own version um so um i i think the the industry standard should remain with cves they should have a cve attached to it i think it's good that vendors have their own ids to manage things internally because they can't always get cves assigned quickly um, um they, they should try to get a cve it can be difficult um they are neglected. A uh, big part of that is um, uh, U.S. federal regulations require fixes for CVEs under a certain time span. So um, people who provide uh, a security for people, uh, they have to work off of CVEs and off of the severity of CVEs and fix them in a, in a, a timeline for, for U.S. government organizations. Me again. Um, so I've got a bunch of snaps that are published in the store and the Ubuntu security team scan them periodically. And I get an email that tells me there's a vulnerability in libssl or whatever. You should, you know, please rebuild that snap and publish a new version that's got the fixes from the repository, right? Have you considered putting that information public and constantly up to date, much like the CVE like pages uh -huh. that you have because i get that email and i know loads of other people who have snaps get those emails uh -huh. and they don't necessarily rebuild the snaps maybe they're on vacation and they're the only maintainer and nobody out in the wider world can have confidence that these things don't have security vulnerable software inside them without the visibility of the stuff and if it's all sat in the inbox of the person who uploaded the snap nobody knows you are absolutely correct, and you need to talk to Snaps about that. Um, that's an issue. That's an issue we've raised. Um, that information is technically public. It's not not it's not easily accessible. Um, so how the Snaps are working is um, when a Debian package is fixed for a vulnerability, um, and that Deb package was used to make a Snap, uh, there's a report that automatically is sent to the Snap maintainer. Um, 
the, the tooling to do that reporting is public. It's, um, uh, I think it's in our UCT repo. I might be wrong on exactly where it is. Um, but it's a really simple checker. And if you, if you like, uh, did like a git clone, um, it won't track vulnerabilities in that. It's only going to track vulnerabilities in the deb, which is another issue. Well, thank you. <laughs>